as a child and a young man. Albert Einstein did not live up to what other people expected of him. But when it seemed like the world had given up on him, he was only getting started. His family name means one stone in German. Looking at Albert as if he was a single stone, Einstein, might make you ask where we can find more stones like him. In some ways, he lived in his own world in his imagination. We have seen this before with Oliver Heaviside, but Albert had friends and made new ones easily. His imagination was focused on a lot of the things this book is about. As a child, Albert liked to think in pictures. By the age of three, his family was living with their uncle in Munich. The Isar River flows down from the Alps mountain range to this German city, making Munich ideal for generating electricity, which was the Einstein family business. By the time Einstein was five, he had a miniature steam engine and a compass to play with as toys. The next year, the Einstein firm had 200 employees and provided electric lighting for the first time ever for Munich's big festival in October, the Oktoberfest. By the time he was 10, a family friend gave him a series of science books called People's Books on Natural Science. The series began about how to imagine the speed of light. That thought stayed with Einstein once he was older. By the time Albert was 12, he was studying the math of shapes from the ancient Greeks, and his uncle coached him on learning how Arabic math experts had used X to stand in for something unknown. By 15, he was working on the fancier kind of math by Newton and Leibniz. In other words, for a kid, Albert Einstein was right where the action was in terms of electricity and learning about the science of light. Life got more complicated when Einstein turned 15 his dad and uncle's company lost their money right when they were about to get a big job in Munich. Albert's family moved to Italy, settling in Pavia and leaving him to finish school in Munich. But his school wanted him to leave too. And Christmas 1894 saw Albert taking a train through the Alps, leaving Germany behind. At first, he helped at his family's new electricity company in Italy. Such a unique job for a young science student. But a polytechnic school in Zurich was Albert's best chance for an education in science nearby. He did great on the science and math and the tests to get in, but not on all the other things he was supposed to know, like French. He needed another year before he started. So Albert Einstein at 16 went to a country school in the Swiss village of Aarau for the year before starting school in Zurich. This village school and the family Albert stayed with turned out to be one of the best chances to learn he had ever had in his life. Earlier in the century, a Swiss educator named Johann Pestalozzi changed the rules for school and succeeded in helping most people in Switzerland learn how to read as children. He believed the hand and the heart needed to learn as well as the head. The small Swiss village school taught science Pestalozzi's way, and that was the way Albert liked to see it in his mind. Einstein had a lot more math than Faraday had, 
but he was not great at it. Albert's mind was his own special lab, where, among other things, he could review the science history discussed in this book. These big events in science history were in his books, too. The compass magnet that moved near Orsted's battery, showing something from the battery, was pushing into space. Faraday's many phenomena, showing how magnets could produce electricity by moving them inside a circle of wire. Einstein especially appreciated Maxwell and his math for how Faraday's electric and magnetic field changed through space. The basic vibes that travel for electricity and magnets were understood to travel about as fast and in the same way as light. Einstein knew about the telegraph and the telephone that followed. Describing his thoughts at Aral after he was older, Einstein said, if a person could run after a light wave with the same speed as light, you would have a wave arrangement which could be completely independent of time. Of course, such a thing is impossible. So when he was 16 years old, Albert began asking himself what it was like if two riders could travel on two different beams of light. When Albert turned 17, the family business in Pavia had failed again. He graduated from the Arau village school second in his class, and that autumn he began his higher studies in Zurich. He studied Hertz and Kirchhoff on his own, and wished his science teacher taught Maxwell, but only older science was taught there then. His math teacher thought Albert should work harder, and his science teacher did not like his attitude. It was hard to do well, and he also fell in love with the only woman in his classes at school. They later married. After Albert became a success, years later, that math teacher even helped work on Albert's great ideas. But back then, Einstein had to write his higher degree paper and do his own original research. He had his heart set on measuring how light travels. He suggested his own approach. Unfortunately, Albert did not know about Michelson-Morley's failed experiment, and he did not know about another 12 or so tries by other scientists. Instead, his main science teacher made him work on a problem that did not excite him. Then at 21, Albert Einstein received his diploma and did everything he could to try to get a good job teaching or as a lab assistant. Light was still in his thoughts. As the new century approached in 1900, Albert Einstein was an unemployed graduate with a higher degree, trying to get teaching jobs, trying to get lab jobs too. He did find work later, thanks to a friend from school, but it was government paperwork. Meanwhile, in his mind, right about the turn of the century, Albert thought, what if light always measured at the same speed? Because that is what light does. The idea that this was a special quality of light itself made other scientists' math work out right. George Fitzgerald had already latched onto the right sense of light with his idea of length getting shorter if something was moving fast enough. Then another man named Hendrik Lawrence figured out how changes like that related to other things you can measure, like time. Then one stone came along on top of all the amazing work done by other scientists with his suggested answer. This answer about light always going the same speed led to questions people are still asking today.
Einstein had more answers he figured out around then, and he published five in all just a few years later. Finding that time depends on light was only one of Einstein's great ideas. In a few years, it became the talk of the 20th century, the 1900s. There is something important about electric and magnetic vibes and their ups and downs, and the same with light, because time itself waits on these. Changes that radiate through space on these vibes create the events in time that we can measure. But in 1900, this was still an answer that the world had not heard suggested. And Albert needed a job.